pretty much everyone has noticed that it feels like we're heading into a bit of a dystopian situation. So I thought what better time than to talk about my favorite dystopian, The Hunger Games. So I first read The Hunger Games when I was about 10 years old. I was really surprised when my mom actually let me read it. I read the whole series as fast as I could and then I went ahead and read pretty much everything the dystopian genre had to offer, which at the time was a lot. The first Hunger Games movie had just come out and publishers and writers alike were just pumping out dystopian books. I revisited The Hunger Games a couple years later when I was about 14 and kind of dove back in a little obsessively and was able to see them for their literary merit. Coincidentally, that's when my love for literature really began and what led me to be the literature and creative writing major that I am now. So I have a lot to be thankful for with The Hunger Games because it really set me off on the path that I'm on now. For those of you that don't really remember The Hunger Games craze, The Hunger Games basically exploded and brought dystopian YA to the forefront of the publishing world, for better or for worse. Publishers at the time were so desperate to get more YA dystopian because it was selling so well that they even told different writers that they were working with, writers that had no experience in the young adult field, to please try and write a young adult dystopian novel because that's what's selling right now and we want money. And because of this, the market was incredibly saturated with these basically Hunger Games copycats. And not, not every dystopian out there was a Hunger Games copycat. Many dystopians came before the Hunger Games, many came after that were completely original and could stand on their own. But I'm mostly in this video going to be talking about the wave of copycats that followed. And as somebody that read a lot of those copycats, I can just, I can say right now, there were a lot of flops. So in this video, I wanted to look at what exactly works about The Hunger Games versus some of the copycats that came after it that failed to replicate what I believe made The Hunger Games the wonderful series that it was. I'm just going to do a brief disclaimer. I have not read The Ballad of Songbirds or whatever it's called. I have not read The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. This is purely going to be talking about the original series. So if you're looking for a video that is either praising or bashing Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, this isn't it. I haven't read it yet. I don't know if I ever will. And without further ado, let's get into the reasons why The Hunger Games works. So the first reason why I believe The Hunger Games works is because of Suzanne Collins' respect for her readers. The audience for The Hunger Games is teenagers, and what I often see in the young adult genre, which really makes me sad, is adult writers sort of writing down to their audience because they know that they're teenagers and they assume that teenagers can't handle some of the things that would be seen in adult fiction. Suzanne Collins doesn't do this. Even though the writing itself is pretty simple and accessible, the themes that she's dealing with are not themes that she takes lightly, nor does she shy away from really getting into them. Suzanne Collins understood that the world she created was a cruel one and she didn't shy away from the harsh reality it required. It required violence, corruption, lots and lots and lots of politics, Politics. It required morally gray characters, it required heartbreaking deaths, and most of all it required a strong focus on mental health and how the conditions of the world around you affect that. And Suzanne Collins pulls no punches. She's aware of the dark and unforgiving universe she's created, and she makes her readers aware of it too, despite the fact that the most of them are between the ages of 10 and 18. Before moving on, I want to add in a little side note. Books don't have to be dark to be good or have literary merit. However, in this particular case, where Suzanne Collins constructed a world that she knew was going to need violence, corruption, political unrest, and a lot of heartbreaking deaths, she didn't hold back from giving that to the readers, which just added a stronger sense of realism to the world that she created. Grim! Grim! I volunteer! I volunteer! I volunteer as tribute! Uh, I believe we have a volunteer. Uh, <laughs> 
The second reason is actually one of my favorites, the bucking of the chosen one trope. For those of you that aren't familiar with this archetype, I really liked the explanation that writer Chris Winkle gave on his blog Mythcreants. Characters of the chosen one archetype are hailed as the most important person in their setting for reasons that are entirely outside their control. The archetype is used to prop up bland characters who have done nothing to earn praise. Because these characters were born better than everyone else, they don't have to practice or work hard to make a difference. So the popularity of the chosen one is huge in the young adult genre, dystopian or otherwise. If you were on book Twitter, book Tumblr, or book anything back in like 2014, you saw all of the chosen one memes pointing out the sheer number of people that were just somehow special and could somehow lead a rebellion, take down the monarchy, start a war, what have you. And I think that the reason for that is because Making the main character the chosen one is easy. It effectively sells the readers on the idea that the main character is this normal person that's just been thrown into this new world. And that also means that the main character can act as a vessel for the reader's questions. As the chosen one, they'll be told all of the details about the, about the world that they're in, maybe the powers that they somehow have acquired, why they're the chosen one, all of this stuff. They'll be told that, and the reader can just sit back and let that happen to them. Whereas if a character is not a chosen one and they're just living in this, you know, very messed up world, then the author has to put work into having the main character themselves slowly show the reader what this world looks like and what the confines of the world are, along with doing all of the normal story stuff like character development and backstory. The ubiquitousness of this trope is completely understandable when you think about how effective it is as a delivery method to the reader, but it's often very unrealistic and can get very tiring after you read 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 dystopian novels where the main character is another white teenage girl that just suddenly has the ability to stop all of the terrible things that are happening in this fictional world. The Hunger Games functions differently because Katniss chooses herself. Her little sister Prim is chosen to enter into the Hunger Games and Katniss immediately knows that she cannot let her sister go into the Hunger Games because she'll die. Because of this, Katniss volunteers to go in Prim's place. You could say that Katniss's hand is being forced, but she still does make the decision. This does so much for Katniss as a character. It adds a sense of realism to the story because the main character isn't simply being plucked out of the masses and being told, hey, you're going to change the world with your whatever, your teenageness. It also gives her a sense of character motivation right off the bat. She's in this to protect her sister and to hopefully return to her at the end of this. And beyond that, it also fuels the reader's empathy and support of the character. Even though you're just learning who Katniss is as a character, you want to support her because she committed this very selfless act of saving her sister. The trope is further subverted when Katniss chooses to defy the capital at the end of the first book. She knows what she's doing when she holds up the berries to the cameras, and it serves as an intentional act to then fuel the rebellion that'll happen in the next two books. Going into Catching Fire, Katniss then has to pretend that she's not the chosen one and that she's not somebody that is intentionally fueling this rebellion that's happening. It's a really interesting juxtaposition to one of the most common and frankly annoying tropes in the young adult genre. And what's more, it also gives Katniss as a character a great advantage. Katniss as a character is usually very sullen and hostile and not always a pleasant person to be around. By setting her up as a character that takes the initiative and effectively chooses herself rather than waiting to be chosen makes it so that she can be sullen and hostile as much as she wants, but the core of her character will still be the sense of duty and initiative that we see right in the first chapter when she immediately goes to help her sister. And then again later when she decides that she's going to challenge the system. Convince me. For you, Miss Everdeen. Do convince me. For the sake of your loved ones. And for the third reason, I'm going to be talking about the love triangle. Now, love triangles are very common in young adult dystopians, or just young adult in general. 
and they can be exhausting. And the reason why they usually are exhausting is because they're typically shallow. It's difficult as a writer to develop two characters that essentially have the same goal, which in the love triangle scenario is getting into the main character's pants. The way The Hunger Games differs is that Gale and Peeta though both wanting to be with Katniss, have other goals as well, and they have different strategies for how they meet those goals. Gale wants to see a tangible change in his circumstances, and he's willing to risk everything to achieve that. Peeta also believes in peace and change, and he wants to have a safer future for his family, but he's more of a pacifist due to his traumatic experiences with the capital thus far. Katniss cares very deeply for both characters pretty early on in the series, but both Gale and Peeta are coincidentally attached to a political choice, so the majority of the romance that takes place is actually connected to the larger plot. This not only furthers the plot while implementing romance, but also makes it so there's little downtime and there's little fluff in between. When Katniss is sorting through her feelings about the two of them, she's also sorting through her feelings about the political implications that are attached to either character. During the events of Catching Fire, Katniss knows that choosing Peeta essentially means quelling the beginning rebellion. If she continues to feed into the idea that she made her decision in the arena purely out of love, then all the implications of her actions are mute and the rebellion has no fire under it. However, if she chooses Gale, the exact opposite happens and it proves that her feelings towards Peeta were not actually genuine, which would mean that her choice with the berries was purely political. It's a brilliant way of constructing the love triangle because it's furthering the plot and also gives Katniss the chance to have a lot of introspective moments. When she's deciding not only who she loves, but also which side in this battle that she's begun, she'll end up taking. The resolution of the love triangle, or Katniss's choice, is actually crucial to her character development. After three books of being the poster child for this rebellion, she has to consider what she actually wants when everything is over and there's peace again. This also contributes to the final message that you see at the end of the book, which is about finding peace and moving on after trauma and political upheaval, which leads us into my next point. Reason number four directly ties into reason number one, which, if you remember, is Suzanne Collins's respect for the reader. The main character's trauma and her backstory are manifested in her actions and personality throughout the series. In the wave of Hunger Games copycats, I saw a whole lot of young adult protagonists that have a traumatic backstory almost as a notch on their belt, or a little medal for cool points. And if it's not used as a, ooh, look at this, I had a traumatic backstory, it's often used as a mystery that the reader has to solve. Now the second option isn't always bad, I've seen a lot of writers do that really well, but Katniss's upbringing is directly impacting who she is as a character in the present, so it really makes sense for Suzanne Collins to basically lay everything out and show how Katniss's traumatic childhood really impacted her and led her to make some of the decisions that she makes in the series. Katniss only learns how to hunt after being on the brink of starvation. This not only gives her the practical skills that she'll need throughout the series, but also the endurance and the will to survive. Both of these traits are essential to Katniss's growth and survival as a character. Losing her father and needing to provide for her mother and sister make it so that her sense of survivalism and determination are intrinsic to her personality, and that carries through both her progress in the arenas and also progress in leading the rebellion. Now going back to the respecting the audience thing that was brought up earlier, Suzanne Collins understands that her readers are able to see a character that's traumatized. They're able to see the manifestation of trauma. Katniss's mental health takes up a huge portion of Mockingjay. You see how Katniss is struggling with the trauma she faced in the arena, her issues with her self-worth that's now attached to saving her nation, and the stress of constantly having herself and her loved ones at risk. All of those things come to the surface mainly in Mockingjay, but they're present throughout all three books. Suzanne Collins lets them be at the forefront of the story. She understands that once again, her readers can handle it, and she also understands that it's going to make the universe and Katniss herself feel more real. And at the end of the day, the dystopian genre is supposed to make you look at your own world and see how it could progress into what it is in the novels. If a dystopian world has a main character that seems to come out through the whole thing completely unscathed, it's not going to feel real. So having Katniss go through these struggles with her mental health not only serves as mental health representation, but also serves to make the universe feel more real, and also makes the consequences of letting the society get to that point even more damaging and terrifying. This year, you're dealing with all experienced killers. All right. What does that mean for us? That means you're going to have to have some allies. Okay. I think that if we... Oop, you're not the prop. No.
For the fifth and final reason, I'm going to be talking about the side characters. Side characters in The Hunger Games are more than a plot device, which the same can't really be said for a lot of the Hunger Games copycats that followed in its footsteps. Most young adult dystopians are in first person, The Hunger Games included. And I personally love the first person perspective. The only problem that can sometimes arise with that is the universe becomes centered on the main character and we fail to see this universe through other perspectives. This is worsened by the fact that young adult dystopians often give the main character chess pieces rather than characters that, we're going, that are going to support them. Common chess pieces that you'll see are one or typically two love interests, an army general or someone of importance that's actually going to pave and guide the way for this teenager that's somehow going to save the world, a motivator like Prim or maybe the character's mother, or sometimes when we're getting really nuanced, also the love interest, and then your various antagonists, the girl that wears combat boots alongside the main character and knows how to shoot a gun or wield an axe or shoot a bow and arrow. And maybe you've noticed that all of the people that I just listed are technically in The Hunger Games. The love interests are Gale and Peta, one of the generals could be Boggs from Mockingjay, the motivator is Prim, or in the first book, Rue. The antagonists are Coin, Snow, occasionally people like Kato, or Enobaria and Brutus, and the strong edgy girl that can also fight with weapons would be Joanna. But The Hunger Games develops them beyond just being helpers for the main character. I've already talked about the love interests and how they have their own goals. For Gale, it's committing to the rebellion, and for Peta, it's staying with Katniss and therefore promoting peace. Boggs has his own complicated feelings towards Coin, the person that he's supposed to be supporting. Prim, though seen as sweet and innocent and all of the things that Katniss wants to protect is herself wanting to be a doctor and go into the medical field, giving her interests and a personality beyond just being Katniss's little sister. And I'll bring up Joanna again in a little bit. Catching Fire is a really interesting subversion of the whole idea that the main character is given a whole cast of characters to help them along with their plot. All of the characters that are with Katniss in the arena are technically supposed to be there to help her. They, unbeknownst to Katniss, are there to help support the rebellion and therefore keep her and Peeta alive. Before going into the arena, Haymitch tries to steer Katniss in the direction of Finnick and Joanna, but Katniss doesn't like them. Katniss does not get a great first impression of either of them and basically tells Hamish that no, she wants Wyrus and Mags and Beatty. Luckily enough, they're also part of the rebellion, but they're not thought to be super helpful and therefore they can't really embody the cast of characters here to help the main character role. Going into the arena, Finnick and Joanna are there to help further the plot, but Katniss is completely blind to this. Because she doesn't see them as necessarily helpers or enemies, she's able to develop genuine feelings, whether negative or positive, towards them. The situation that they're in and catching fire also adds to the authenticity of it all because Katniss knows that she'll eventually have to kill them and yet in spite of herself she's still seeing them as real human beings. This gives the readers a chance to view Finnick and Joanna as real characters and we get to see them for their faults and their talents. And Katniss's scope isn't limited to just her own. She understands that all of the characters, Joanna and Finnick especially, are people that she could have become. And Joanna acts as a representation of who Katniss could have become had she also lost her family like Joanna had. Finnick accomplishes the same thing but instead of focusing on his family, who is also likely dead, they focus on his mistreatment and the way that he was forced into prostitution after winning the Hunger Games. Both of these scenarios could have easily happened to Katniss and probably would have had she not stirred up the rebellion. And you can do this with practically every character in the story because all of them are so affected by the universe that they're living in. For example, you could even view a character like Cato as somebody that Katniss could have become had she grown up in a district that promoted violence and expected their children to win the Hunger Games. It's the only thing I know how to do bring pride to my district. <laughs> I could really go through and name almost every single character and talk about how Katniss could have become that character, and Katniss herself is able to recognize that and understand that. This fleshes out the universe even more because Katniss can see exactly who she could have become and all of the different paths that are available to her because of the world that she's living in. And those are my five reasons for why The Hunger Games, in my opinion, works. As a final note, I'd like to add, I don't hate the dystopian genre, and I'm not trying to bash any of the books that came after Hunger Games, because I understand a lot of them can stand on their own and they're great books. I'm mostly talking about the blatant copycats that tried to emulate the Hunger Games and failed. If you liked this video, please comment, like, and subscribe. I put out new videos on the second and fourth Monday of every month, so you can always expect something from me on those days. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.